I don't know about you, but I love harvest festivals. I always have done, always will do. I think today, uh, talking earlier to Christine, today in so many churches is Harvest Festival Day. Maybe it's the last, it's the last one in, sep- in September. We put ours back at Newtown from last week because of national events. But it's this time of year when we have wonderful demonstrations of God's goodness to us. Look at these lovely things down here. They're great, aren't they? And we give thanks, don't we, for his provision. You think back and you think about the the prophets of doom in the summer when we had the drought and the crops wouldn't happen. Well, they seem to have done all right, really, down there, don't they? And many, many crops have done well. Some perhaps not quite as well. But God is good. And we had the rains just when we needed them. And a lot of things have swollen and there's fruitfulness of the earth. Well, many religions give thanks for the fruitfulness of the earth. But we are giving thanks to the creator, the only true God, the one that David knew, the one that the people of Israel worshipped, the one who they wish to build a temple for in our chapter. And I want to look at those verses we read under three headings. And we'll learn some lessons from this chapter. First heading is this, gifts given by the people. It's setting the the scene, if you like, verses 1 to 9. Secondly, main heading, the great God who gives to his people verses 10 to 13 and then God's gift of grace 14 to 20 there are three headings tonight first one then gifts given by the people let's look at the context of the prayer that David brings the background to 1 Chronicles 29 now this chapter comes right at the end of that book 1 Chronicles which deals primarily with the history of Israel. Throughout the book, the main theme is the sovereignty of God, a theme we see reinforced in David's prayer. The central human character in this book is King David. It contains a selection of incidents from his life, not all of them, and there's some high spots, there's some great things. There's the bringing of the ark, of God back to Jerusalem after it had been recaptured. But there's some low points too. It talks about the census that he carried out that he was not supposed to do. Warts and all concerning King David, but here at the end and towards the end of his life, here he is giving praise to God. He is still on fire for the Lord. He wants to start the building of the temple. He's been told by God, It's not you that's going to build it. Your son is going to build it. David was not allowed to do so because of his sin. But David wants to, if you like, prepare the way for that building. And so in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 29, we see him urging the people to join him in giving to the work of the Lord. When you have a building project, a big one, you've got to make plans You've got to get it ready and you've certainly got to get the finances together because you've seen them, haven't you? These half-finished hospitals, half-finished buildings around the place. Here are plans being laid, the finances and other resources being got ready. David is encouraging the people to give, not just in word but in deed also. And he shows them by example giving a substantial proportion of his wealth towards this work. The implication is pretty much the whole of his wealth towards it. His personal fortune went to the Lord. I wonder, doesn't that challenge us really? In our materialistic, our self-gratifying age, do we give to the work of the Lord? Simple question, I'm sure you do. But how much? It was sacrificial giving here with with King David. John Lang, 
who founded the building firm, lived in the same small house for 40 years. He could have built his own great big mansion, couldn't he? He gave generously throughout his life, so much so that when he died, only £300 was left in the bank. And have you heard the story concerning John Wesley? All he left behind were two silver spoons. But what a legacy he left behind in other ways, in spiritual ways, if you like, concerning the work that God had given him to do. I wonder, are we as willing to give as, as these worthies? We should examine ourselves in the light of this scripture, but other scriptures as well, of course. Note that to give is a holy act, a consecration. David's challenge at the end of verse 5 is this. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? David leads by example, but the people were not found wanting. They respond to David's call. And if you look at verse 6, you see the various potentates in the land really responding. Leaders of the father's houses, tribes of Israel, captains of thousands and of hundreds, officers. These are the big noises in the land. They are giving to. Everyone who could do so responded. And they offered willingly. Again, you go on to read in verses 7 and 8 what they gave. And it's a, a fortune. So many talents of gold, silver, iron, bronze. Some commentators tried to work out how much it was. Well, it's kind of difficult, really, but suffice to say, it's millions of pounds. Much more than you would need for the building project itself. They gave and they gave and they gave. It wasn't just money, of course. It was precious stones as well. A number were mentioned there. And look at the attitude with which they gave. Verse 9. The people rejoiced. For they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. God loves a cheerful giver. So, the question right at the start is, how do you and I serve and honour God? How do we give to him? Is it willingly? Or is it grudgingly? Or is it, well, that's what we do. I wonder, am I... Are you a cheerful giver or a sullen one or something in between? We should be serving the Lord with joy in every aspect of our Christian life, including the privilege of giving to him. What sort of child doesn't want to please their father? If your father gives a child a bag of sweets... It's an ungrateful child who doesn't offer a sweet back to the dad, isn't it? Well, it's a trite picture in a way, but it's a true picture. God's given us so much. Shouldn't we be responding as cheerful givers to him? Secondly then, let's look at the great God who gives to his people. Who is this great God to whom we bring our gifts then? Why is it necessary to give our thanks to him? And David gushes forth with all sorts of things. We can only uh, skim the surface. It's his prayer of praise, really, in verses 10 to 13. It's a prayer that, I don't know if you noticed, has echoes of the Lord's Prayer. The one that Jesus taught his disciples. So let's study it. Firstly, in these verses, we see who God is. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. He's praying. He's praising. When we do that, we are coming to the Lord. The Lord God of Israel. The exalted one. Lord in capital letters signifying the name that the Jews would not speak. <coughs> this great God. This awesome God. This wonderful, majestic God here is addressed as the Lord God of Israel, our Father. Even in Old Testament times, when you consider he was 
the, the, the awesomeness of him. There he is in a fatherly relationship with his children, the people of Israel. The people of Israel could come to God as father because they were his special people. And we can approach God too as our father because we're his. Because we belong to him. Because his son paid that ransom for us. Jesus himself encouraged us, didn't he, to start our prayers in coming to God as our father who art in heaven. Yes, our holy God is unapproachable in one respect. But we have the privilege of approaching him because of the Lord Jesus. He is someone that we, his creatures, would never dare to approach in our own strength. It's only through the Lord Jesus that we can come. He pleads our cause before God. He died on the cross bearing our sins that we might have a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and we may go in. Praise the Lord who he is. The Lord God of Israel, our Father. But second, when he is, forever and ever. Other versions of the Bible, from everlasting to everlasting. There has never been a time when God has not been there. Indeed, he's outside of time. We're here on this planet for a short while. The Bible calls it a, a breath. Uh, Hymn writer Henry Light got it right when he penned these words. Frail as summer's flower we flourish, blows the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures, unchanging on. He is forever. He has no beginning, no end. Surely, believer, doesn't that reassure you this evening? He is always there for you. He is your heavenly father. We have the promise of spending eternity with the Lord if we're his forever. But then in verse 11, David goes on to talk about what is his, what belongs to him. And again, there's shades of the Lord's prayer here. Can you see a crescendo here? Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, greatness leading to power, leading to glory, leading to victory, leading to majesty, or altogether. It's overlaying it. This is our God. No human picture can do him justice. He is the power. There is no nobody, nothing that can stand against him. He is the glory. Isaiah had to fall down before him. He's the victory. He has the victory. His son has the victory over sin. He is majestic. Don't know if you are as amused as we are by the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, summer and winter. Usually the host city seeks to outdo the previous host city they spend a fortune and they try and showcase their city or, or their nation they'll have displays they'll have stirring music they'll have fireworks visual effects planning takes several months if not years uh, it's over in an instant but they think it's worth it they've spent millions of pounds for that one event so much effort is put in Yet this will result in something which is only like a child banging a drum or a damp squib compared to the glorious nature of God, his majesty, his power, his might. Our attempts to look spectacular are nothing. Our God is holy. He is all powerful. He is all glorious. He's glorious in his majesty throughout all eternity. Supreme power over everything. He brought our nations into being. He brought our planets into being. The solar system, as far as the eye can see, and beyond, beyond. Our God is wonderful. Do you, do you ever contemplate the awesomeness 
of our God. He owns everything in heaven and earth. Everything is his. That's the end of verse 11. David is acknowledging that. David, a great king, great power himself, great possessions. And yet he knew that everything he had came from God. We like to say, mine is my family, my car, my job, and so on. Anything we have has come from God. He's been pleased to bless us. We only have them because he wants us to have them. We speak of our food, don't we? But that food, those things we eat, they've come from God. He's allowed the rain to fall. He's sent the sun to shine. The crops are ripened. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. What's the next line? But it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. And so it goes on. We'll sing it later. It's his world. He made it. He cares for it. We're called to be stewards of it. But he's the one who gives the increase. Our crops don't ultimately come from our gardens, our allotments, our food is not from the supermarket, it's from God himself. And we should remember that day by day. If David the king could remember it, surely we should. God's indeed was the kingdom. David acknowledged that. He himself was only a temporary ruler, here for a little while, and he was about to hand the kingdom over to Solomon. And that kingdom would then pass on to Solomon's son, albeit in a fractured way, and then it would continue to fracture and there'd be problems. People would reject God and they'd go into exile. All of the history you know in the Old Testament. But Almighty God on the throne is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His kingdom, where he is the head over all, is eternal. And he's the best of rulers. He's not a good king, bad king. He is a forever holy, righteous, wonderful king. Praise his name. Give him the thanks. Give him the glory. He is a loving king. I wonder if everyone here knows him as king and is serving him as king. If you don't, bow down before him. Confess your sins. Run to him. But also David goes on to talk about what God gives in verse 12. Riches and honour, he highlights. Both riches and honour come from you. He gives riches, everything we have. We've already said that. Honour, anything that comes our way in terms of recognition. He's made that happen. He makes great in, his, in your hand it is to make great. David could acknowledge that. Remember he'd gone from a shepherd boy to the king in Israel. He gives strength. Every breath we take is from God. Every step along the way, every waking day is from him. We owe our lives to him. Surely that should motivate us to return thanks to him. Look at verse 13. After those three verses we've just sort of analysed, there can be no other response, can there, to these things, to who God is, what he has done. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Do you do that? Do you meditate upon him? And do you return thanks to him from a grateful heart? When all thy mercies, O oh my God, my rising soul surveys, astounded by the view I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. I wonder if that's your view. I wonder if you think upon him daily. Well, let's just look finally at God's gift of grace. Because David, giving that praise, giving that thanks to God, talking of God, the giver, carries on. And he almost 
points the spotlight upon himself. But who am I? Verse 14. And who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? It's a kind of rhetorical question, isn't it? Who am I? He knows the answer, really. But he's so overwhelmed by what has happened that he has to express his emotions. He's highlighting the fact that what has happened is a great testimony to the work of God's grace in the hearts of the people to give to the work willingly. God has put that into their hearts. They want to respond to God, him, his high officials, the others in the land. They've given generously because God has first given to them of his riches generously and abundantly. He first gives to us so much and that enables us to give back to him. Look at the harvest produce. Harvest is a wonderful time, as I said at the start. We can bring our thanks in this visible way, but we can bring our thanks throughout the year in all sorts of different other ways. Just think them through, prayerfully ask God to help you to return things to him. We need to acknowledge his bounty, his goodness to us more and more in our increasingly secular and godless society. If you have the opportunity this week and someone says to you, oh, you had a harvest, did you? Well, it was pretty bad this year, wasn't it? Opportunity. Speak to them and say, no, God has blessed us. Look at what we have. Look at what the fields have produced. He is on the throne and, and just use it. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. That is right. But more than that, of course, he is our saviour. David was a great king. He led the people in the main well. But David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is far, 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 far greater. Jesus coming into the world, living amongst us, dying, rising again, all for that great plan of salvation. That's grace. Undeserved favour. David knew that. He knew, as the verses go on to explain, that God sees him through and through. And David himself knew he was a big, big sinner. But he knew that he would be right with God because he looked forward to his greater son, King David's greater son, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as Christians, we can just give thanks to God, yes, for the material, but particularly for the spiritual blessings in him. What a saviour we have. Saviour who's done all these things and is coming again for you and me. Hallelujah. Worship him. In the meantime, though, we're to give our lives in his service. We're to be working for him. David makes that prayer. And then in verse 20, he encourages everyone else. Now bless the Lord your God. Praise the Lord your God. That's what it means. Give thanks to him. And all the assembly bless the Lord God of their fathers. Bowed their heads. They acknowledged that in, in comparison to God, they were nothing. And they prostrated themselves. They actually lay before the Lord and the King. It's a physical manifestation of what they were feeling. Everything had come from God. They wanted to show that they were worshipping him with their whole being. The people had brought their gifts in abundance. They knew that God had put it in their hearts to do so. That he first put the wealth in their hands. So they acknowledged those things as they acknowledged him as Lord. And that is a challenge to us this evening, isn't it? Do we acknowledge him as Lord in every aspect of our lives? Things we have our own lives in terms of our prayer life, reading the Bible. We have opportunity to 
give him the praise as we go out this week to worship him in so many different ways. Yes, we are sinners, but we are sinners saved by grace in order to do good works. Let's do them as we give him the praise, the honour and the glory. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord for all his love.